Christmas 1939 was a very dark time in the history of Europe. A year earlier, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had signed a peace agreement with Adolf Hitler. Chamberlain <laughs> returned to Britain and stepped off the plane, waving his umbrella, peace in our time, he cried. In that same year, 1938, the Scottish Presbyterian Church closed their mission to Jews in Budapest, Hungary, and the head of the mission, the Reverend George A.F. Knight, had come back to Glasgow as our minister. He had brought a refugee Jewish couple with him and had them settled in an apartment near the church. Peace in our time seemed pretty unlikely. Hitler was again flexing his muscles. He had defied the armistice agreement and marched into Poland on September 1st, 1939, claiming their territory for Germany. Britain had pledged to Poland that they would come to their aid if Germany invaded. On September 3rd, 1939, I, I was only 15, and city th sitting in Rock Hill Church, waiting for our minister to enter the pulpit at 11 a.m. But there seemed to be some delay. Finally, the Reverend Knight ascended the steps of the pulpit closed the Bible and in solemn voice said that Britain had just declared war on Germany. He asked the organist to play the national anthem and we all stood to sing, God save the King. And with that, we were dismissed. No more service. I remember so vividly running with tears in my eyes all the way to my grandmother's house, halfway to mine. She lived opposite Mary Hill Barracks, the headquarters of the Highland Light Infantry and the Black Watch regiments. Bands were playing and soldiers were marching in the parade ground, and that could be seen from Grandma's kitchen window. It seemed as if they were, they were ready to march away. I was terrified. We were at war again only 20 years after the Great War. It was now three o'clock on that December 25th. Big Ben had just chimed the hour and the family, all six of us, were gathered around our new eight valve radio, the latest technology, no TV then. We had listened on that same radio to broadcast from Radio Luxembourg to hear shouts of Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. After Hitler's speeches, Germany was surely aroused and it was frightening to listen to. The King's Christmas message had become a tradition to bind together the nations of the British Commonwealth. But King George had only been on the throne for two years since the abdication of his elder brother Edward. Edward had renounced the throne after a reign of less than a year in order to marry Mrs. Wally Simpson, a twice divorced American. And the succession fell on the shoulders of his younger brother Bertie and now King George VI. Bertie had wooed the Scottish lady Elizabeth Bosline, whose home was Glam's Castle, a name you'll recognize if you've read Shakespeare's Macbeth. Elizabeth had played hard to get, but finally succumbed after a visit from the Queen Mother Princess Mary of Teck, widow of King George V and King George's grandmother. Grandmothers do have some uses. This was only the second speech delivered by King George, and tension mounted as we waited f for his Christmas message. It was well known that the king had a stutter. We'd read that the queen had given him great support. 
what words of comfort and hope could King George offer? He began haltingly with words I don't remember now. He made frequent pauses to overcome his stutter. But then he quoted from a poem that his wife had given him. He had obviously found comfort in these lines. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night and he led me toward the hills and the breaking of day in the lone east. As a 15 year old, I was impressed that even the king seemed to fear the future. And I remembered those words all my life, but never heard them spoken again until one Sunday morning, about 70 years later, sitting in a pew in Kingswood Church. I was jolted into awareness by hearing them repeated by our director of music, Dennis Llewellyn, our Welshman with the beautiful voice. Now, on this Christmas, when the world is again in turmoil, but with an enemy that cannot be pinned down and certainly not playing by the conventional rules of war, we may well take heed of those words written so long ago by an amateur English poetess, Minnie Louise Haskins. And indeed, go forth and finding the hand of God, tread gladly into the light. Amen, and God bless us, everyone.